Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Mobile World Congress 2017. Brought to you by Intel. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Palo Alto for the Cube special broadcast presentation and coverage of Mobile World Congress, which is happening in Barcelona, Spain. I'm John Furrier here with SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube, and of course, we're covering it here in Palo Alto, bringing in experts and friends who have been following all the action, as well as have commentary and opinion on what's happening. We're going to roll up the news. It's the end of the day in Barcelona. We're just getting our, our sea legs here for day two of 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. coverage inside The Cube, and of course, we want to break down the content. Our next guest is Val Bercicovici, who is the CTO at SolidFire, also a governing board member of the CNCA, the Cloud Native Compute, uh, found CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, which is was KubeCon, which is now part of the Linux Foundation, which if you know the Cube, you know we've been covering that like a blanket, all these shows. Um, the Cube has been there. This is in the world of DockerCon, et cetera, et cetera. Val, a CTO, 19 year veteran at NetApp, of course, knows the storage business, knows the converged infrastructure, knows the cloud, part of the original cloud already. Val, great to see you, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me back on after all these years. Yeah, I mean, it's great to have you on. One, you know, we've, you know, we see each other at some of the parties, and Georgiana's place in particular, Georgiana uh, uh, brings all the storage and cloud already together, but, you and I have had conversations a few years ago about you know, where cloud was going, and you almost kind of connect the dots, um, not to pat ourselves on the back, but I think we were right that the cloud was what we thought it would be, and probably more. I mean, for me, I think I underestimated certainly the Amazon impact. Um, but you look at what's happening in, in, in Mobile World Congress, you have a bipolar show. You have a device show, right. rah, rah, look at the <laughs> fancy devices, and the other show you have uh, a telco, show yeah. that's trying to figure out their future. And that's interesting because the telcos power the big networks that everyone is using the devices for. So you have a consumer market, but the real conversation is 5G, IOT, you have a collision course of enterprise issues, enterprise data center, enterprise technology, coll colliding with a telco infrastructure, AKA mobile, head on. So it's yeah. not just more wireless. 5G, certainly the story, we talked to folks like Intel and others around that, but you know, you have essentially all these core problems that are going to scale up this next generation use cases right. are enterprise-like. This is your wheelhouse. So yeah, are you like looking at this saying, hmm, I've seen this movie before, what's your thoughts? Actually, I haven't, and that's what's so <laughs> exciting, right? There's, as you said, there's so much innovation happening. For me, probably the big story is what's not in the headlines at, at Mobile World Congress, which is the back office work to support a 5G rollout. And I've had a lot of experience, particularly on a solid fire side most recently, speaking with all the big telcos globally and their NFV implementations. And what's interesting is they're all going through a, a Gen 2 or a re-architecture right now. Uh, a lot of first generation NFV was done based on traditional or legacy now cloud architecture, which is very VM based. And all of them are now architecting and implementing microservices based implementations. And a driver for that is just the explosion that 5G will enable in terms of connectivity between devices. So you know, the least interesting stat to me is how fast I can download a movie off of 5G. The most interesting is how many hundreds of thousands or millions of devices within my domain are going to be communicating with each other on 5G. Yeah, we had Sar Galai, who's going to come back today. He's also a guest now, he's former HP or uh, HPE, HP Enterprise. He ran there, built their communications group, all the NFE. I like it, and he was commenting the same thing, and he made a point I want to bring up, which is, I don't really need more, a gigabit right now, I want more battery life. So right. you know, he's kind of you know, being pedestrian in his use case, but that really is kind of the consumer issue. You're pointing about things that are going to be harder to do, and NFV you mentioned is one of them. What, can you explain the NFV current situation? Because also, also we've been doing a lot of the OpenStack, right. all the OpenStack shows since it started. That has become kind of a telco NFV storage show as well. Absolutely. Um, so what is the real issue with NFV and why is it important and relevant to the service providers right now? So if you take a look at all the services we depend on on our phones nowadays, there's obviously the basic connectivity, there's additional services around location mapping for GPS, layered services on top of that in terms of the collaborative apps that we use and depend on every day, sometimes on S3, which is not always available as we're recording right now. There's a lot of layers there, and from an NFV perspective, from a back-end data center perspective, everything amounts to a session. So even though it's packet switched, it's still a logical session you have to set up. So for every session, and imagine this happening millions of times at every tower, and more than millions of times at every regional or, or central data center, you've got to have a session set up where you've got to you know, auth authenticate, actually, 
who the user or the, the device is, make sure they have permission to be on the network and accessing certain things. You've got to authorize them to do certain things. You've got to log what's happening. Then you've got to slap some firewall or security around them. Then you've got to layer in you know, access to all the other resources they're trying to you know, combine into a service back to the end user. There's a lot of things going on. We have to set up these sessions for every connection. And if you try to set up a VM, for every connection, you'd have to find a multi-billion dollar data center Google can't even afford. Yeah, yeah. So this is where microservices are becoming essential right now in a 5G hyper-connected world, is where you have to have much more efficiency in the speed by which you set up these sessions, the efficiency of number of sessions per server, and just the end-to-end -end cost of processing all these transactions. This is interesting, and I, I want to just kind of translate a little bit of that for the folks that aren't um, CTOs out there. Essentially, you think about mobile, we've all been, you know, since the iPhone in, in 2007, we've seen this just accelerate, you know, with data and whatnot. You've been at a concert, you've been in a stadium, and you can't get, you get signal, but you can't connect. Right. That is essentially the base station saying, I can't get a session. Now, as a user, you have a phone, so you've been provisioned by the telco. You actually, they know who you are, um, so you, you have a phone, and you have a device, you just can't connect a session to the, mm -hmm. the radio connector and then get to the internet. That's a known problem. Right. Now, when you think about IOT, Internet of Things, and now people, your watches, your wearables, sensors on airplanes and industrial equipment to traffic lights, those are devices that are going to be provisioned and turned off and on, mm -hmm. so it's like a new phone every time. So you've got the complication of not knowing the devices that are coming on and then trying to establish the connections and figuring all this out. This is kind of a really hard problem. It is. This, <laughs> at this scale, is, it's this really, is really, really hard. a really hard problem at scale at many levels. So to me, what we're hearing at Mobile World Congress is you need a dynamic network. Absolutely. What are some of the tech involved? What's the real enables? You mentioned microservices. We know about containers. Right. Uh, Linux Foundation's opening up their kernel for a lot of variety of new kind of uh, configurations. You got solid state memory and you mm -hmm. got new memory architectures. Uh -huh. What are some of the key things from a technical perspective that are going to change that complexity to be seamless for users? Probably the most fascinating trend to me, and we're just beginning to see some stories emerge around this, is the rise of edge computing. So I kind of hark back to where I started my career, I'm dating myself now, but the <laughs> client-server era yeah. that succeeded from mainframes. We've seen a huge pendulum shift towards cloud computing and centralizing a lot of processing. Well, back to 5G, back to millions, if not billions of connected devices right now, there is no way, Einstein kind of, you know, introduced this problem for us, speed of light, there is no way to process the exponential amount of data we're dealing with right now at the core and still provide useful feedback at the edge. So the rise of edge computing as a bit of a counterbalance to cloud computing and having more powerful, more intelligent processing at the edge, filtering a lot of data because we can't possibly store the exabytes and the autobytes of this data. This is a paradigm shift. What you're talking about is mm -hmm. a new paradigm shift because it used to be a centralized computer and then you had master slave or connected device mm -hmm. terminal, then you had smart terminals, which is clients and then PCs and then you got smartphones. Right. So what you're bringing up is an interesting architecture that is an enterprise data center thing. And we <laughs> we were talking yesterday and then I was talking to the Intel folks, I, I pressed them on this because they're obviously in the data center business, that a car that's fully instrumented like a Tesla or, or future autonomous car is a essentially a moving data center. So it this changes the notion of data. Yes. This is a, a paradigm shift. You agree with that? Moreover, IoT is maybe the first, you know, technology buzzword that takes a lot of this digital world that we've been talking about that's really been largely abstract and virtual for the, the common person, and it makes it physical and real. So the impact of IoT is an actuator changing your traffic light. You know, it's whether you're, you're getting water, or you're getting electricity at your house, whether you're finding your way to, you know, to the, a new location via GPS. That's actually impacting your physical world. It's no longer just a virtual thing. So that's where IoT is going to become really, really significant in our lives. And the software to program that needs to be created. This is an opportunity for entrepreneurs Entrepreneurs, certainly, you know, Peter Burris and I were talking yesterday morning about um, the edge computing, and he's got a big uh, a slew of research on this. And he talks about IoT and P, IoT and, and things and people. Yeah. Um, and we were also talking yesterday about the relationship of e people to technology. So, for instance, in telcos, they view the phone as the relationship that's coupled to the carrier. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, the, the premise we put out yesterday was that that's going to be an uncoupling, it's going to be a person's relationship to multiple carriers, Absolutely, if you will. Yeah. So the question is, how does business extract value out of this? And this is something that, again, Peter Burris and Ricky Bond's digging into, which is the business value of technology. In, in the paradigm we just talked about, mm -hmm. which seems pretty obvious, how we get there, not so obvious, but people are working on that. How should companies think about getting value out of this massive shift 
a lot of a lot of moving parts. What's, the what's the examples are already there. You know, um, let's talk about one of the most talked about companies around here, Uber, right? And, and not for some of the headline reasons <laughs> they're attracting right now, but some of the classical disruption they enabled. When you take a look at the fundamentals of what they do technically, it's interesting, it's somewhat impressive, but it's not revolutionary. What made them revolutionary is digitizing the transportation relationship you and I have with our transportation providers. And when they tapped into that, they realized the potential of that is limitless right now because we're all physical beings. We still have to move ourselves or our food or our packages around. But digitizing transportation is really you know, a great example of any industry, whether it's a 100-year-old industry or brand new industry. Mm -hmm. When you digitize a distribution, and when you actually you know, add digital efficiencies on the back end, you end up with that 100x effect, more than a 10x effect, and truly earn the term disruptor. Give us some more examples that you've seen. I know you mentioned, uh, you talked a lot of telcos, but what other use cases? Because the whole notion of 5G and this new yeah. architecture is really coming down to use cases. And certainly there's the sexy ones, the, yeah. the car, the smart cities. I mean, there's a lot of policy and societal impact issues that need to be thought through, but just generally, what's the low-hanging fruit right now? I would, you know, instead of low-hanging fruit, I might be see, give you the most pedestrian example yeah. I could think of, which is when I uh, meet with some of the waste management companies. You know, years ago, I, I took them for granted. There's no innovation here. It's going to be an old enterprise discussion with some conservative you know, tech leaders. I'm not even going to, you know, I'm going to try and phone this in. I'd show up and meet with them, and they were truly innovating because they realized the whole customer experience of putting out your trash bin, your recycling bin, your you know, organics bin and so forth, your compost bin, can actually be improved. And added, efficiency is added when you put GPS trackers on all the trucks, when you figure out when they have to go to the dump because there's like a, an exponentially high amount or an inordinately high amount of garbage put out early in the route one morning, and the ability for you to know when your bins are picked up so you can actually go and pick up those bins, put them out minutes before yeah. instead of the night before, bring them back minutes after, just reinventing that very pedestrian mundane experience tells me there's opportunities for innovation everywhere in our lives. So really, it's just pick a spot to in, in, make efficient. It's probably the easiest and kind of laying back. Um, great, great feedback, uh, Val. Uh, thoughts on developers, because it's something that we didn't get, and we'd love to have you bring, bring you back for mm -hmm. more time on this, but the CN, uh, uh, CNCF. CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute uh, Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, came out of the Kubernetes Con, right. which and which is the Linux now part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, you mentioned microservices, Kubernetes orchestration. There's a lot of software around composability, whether that's an artisan-like developer yeah. or the hardcore developers down lower on the stack. How does autonomous vehicles and this new future use case, whether it's programming drones or writing cool software? to what's, what's going on in the developer community? Can you share any color on mm -hmm. trends around what being done in traditional classic developer? I think autonomous vehicles are really a perfect example because CNCF fundamentally is about what we call cloud native technologies and applications in a typical cloud native architecture. It's container packaged, not VM packaged, and it's dynamically orchestrated. So we say it's basically declarative as opposed to opinionated to use backend speak, mm -hmm. technical developer speak. But what does that mean? You know, uh, Autonomous cars are not interesting if one car is autonomous. Mm -hmm. Autonomous cars are interesting when dozens, hundreds, perhaps thousands of cars along your route if those are autonomous, the interaction between them and making sure they don't all try to occupy the exact same, occupy the same space at the same time, that's pretty essential, but also keeping traffic flowing smoothly and preventing unnecessary traffic jams. So it's the coordination of multiple processes, multiple things, that's what really makes cloud native computing happen at scale. So CNCF actually is five projects right now. Most people know it as the Kubernetes project, yep. mm -hmm. and it is very much that. I think a year ago, no one knew how hot yeah. Kubernetes would be, but certainly it's taken off right now. Thanks a lot, in part to Google. We've got new technologies around you know, monitoring. So you've got to monitor your app, obviously, in the cloud world to see where the efficiencies and the performances for the end user uh, are on logging, distributed logging and monitoring. We've got new projects around actually debugging at scale. So debugging one process, as simple as any developer knows, debugging multiple concurrent threads or processes, that's still a black art. Mm -hmm. And so we've got open tracing technologies around that. And there's a, a new style of project. It's actually uh, something known as Linkerd, but it's around now in the IoT context, the most important thing to be a really valuable IoT device is discover your context. Yeah. What other devices, what other sensors it are It sounds out like there. an operating system to me. You got linkers, you got loaders, you got all this orchestration. This is a global operating environment. It's a great environment, it's a great, uh, I think, um, you know, uh, insight. It's not, I don't like not to call it an system, operating system. Not like a classic some, sense, but there's some systems it kind is a new operating environment. I think in the cloud yeah. native world, operating system still connotates one PC yeah. or one device yeah. or one host on a data center. It really is a coordination of services. Yeah. 
new modern high-end services. Yeah, and declarative things with containers, it's essentially assembly-based. You can manage things component-wise, um, those kinds of concepts. Absolutely. And you see that as a key part of making the cloud, uh, cloud native as a key part of enabling these new use cases. There's actually no economies of scale if you don't go cloud native nowadays as 5G networks become more prevalent, as IoT becomes more mainstream. It doesn't play without microservice And the trade-off for not being cloud native is what? Uh, being the, being disrupted. It's literally, um, you know, there's some great recent blogs. Uh, you've heard this title before, the coming SaaS apocalypse. <laughs> SaaS so the disruption of the legacy SaaS vendors. The economics of them force you to basically have fixed subscription models with your customers. And whether you're using, you know, your CRM app once a day or a hundred times a day, it costs you the same. These new cloud native architectures are going to enable disruption in the industry because they'll only consume resources as a sessions mm -hmm. for an app, you know, a common SaaS app are used. And the licensing and business model can now be that much more efficient, 10x more efficient for people that actually only get charged yeah. per use as opposed to per subscription. Val, you know, I've gotten to know you over the years and a great guest to have on theCUBE. Thanks for sharing that insight. Um, but it is a robust, it's an exciting time. You, you had a great run at NetApp. I mean, you look at what NetApp's been doing. I mean, they were the darling of Silicon Valley. Uh -huh. Classic success story. Um, multiple reinventions, great founding team, great investors. Just a classic run that they've had. As you look back now going forward, looking back and now looking forward, what are some of the things that gets you jazzed up right now in terms of things that are that, are that next wave that, that's coming? What do, you, what, do you, what do you see that's exciting and what would you share for folks uh, for insight? I'd say the most exciting thing to me at a high level is just the opportunity that you know 5G IoT enables. I think there's a whole new market segment, some people might call it the real evolution of HCI, which is edge computing and all these really fascinating new workloads that are not going to be necessarily virtual desktops in terms of running or operating your business, but entirely new revenue streams, entirely new services that all sorts of companies, digital or analog, can offer. That excites yeah. me. And of course, we've talked about the, the back end rise of the shift towards, away from fast storage, flash storage, towards persistent memory, that in itself is going to open up a whole new category of apps that we've yet to see. Yeah, and we've got to get that Linux kernel rewritten and open up all kinds of new stuff. Great, great commentary, Val. Thanks for coming on the Cube share. We certainly want to have you back and, and really unpack and drill down and double down on what cloud native impact means. And certainly edge and IoT computing really is going to be a fascinating run. I think, I think that's going to open up um, a huge can of worms and an opportunity for really changing the game and creating great value and and risk too. I mean, you know, Amazon S3 is down as we speak. We're joking, <laughs> but you know we see in security problems out there, and we'll we'll stay on top of it. Of course, the cube has got you covered, and and that's the hot themes. Really, that's not being reported at Mobile World Congress that we're reporting, which is the surge in IoT relevance. Obviously, AI is super hype, but that gives a mental model. This is the story of Mobile World Congress. 5G as a fabric connecting in with hard enterprise data center-like technologies end-to-end -end for dynamic experiences. This is the challenge for telcos, and someone will get it done. Let's see who will be. Of course, we'll be watching it. This is theCUBE with more coverage of Mobile World Congress after this short break. <laughs>